ways to appreciate and enjoy, and enjoy the, the promise of spring in the air. Thanks be to God. And we come this morning with uh, hearts that may be somewhat heavy from the news of the world or our own personal struggles, but we come here because we know this is a place where our hearts will be lifted, that the one who is in charge of everything is indeed still God, and we are still God's people. So, so we come with prayers for the many places of anguish in the world and in our hearts, knowing that we have a loving Savior who accepts those upon himself and lifts them up with us. So I also know we come with hope and with joys. Um, and I wonder uh, what concerns and joys are on your hearts. I, I know we have a potato bar after our service next week in honor of St. Patrick's Day. Um, and we're looking forward to that. Thanks to uh, Vicki and the, uh, the uh, church Church Life Committee that is helping put that on. So there's a slide. Is there another slide? There's a slide. <laughs> oh, okay, good. And uh, hope you all will come. I think, are we to bring toppings? Is that, if you have a favorite topping to share? But please come whether you bring anything. And uh, if you can stay, that would be lovely. Uh, prayers for the family of Ted Applegate. Uh, his memorial service was yesterday. Did any of you attend? Uh, TR was anything to share from that? It, it was a very nice service. Uh, the family was there. All right. I had attended. Kendra's not doing well. She, she yeah. Doesn't really, you know, was Haven even there? She, no. They, they said they told her she didn't. Is she at Good Sam's in Ellis? Ellis okay. Ellis. I will go visit. So uh, I would have been there yesterday, but I had my own kind of family emergencies going on without going into detail, but my daughters have really needed me. And so I, anyway, I was in Denver Thursday and Friday, or Friday and Saturday, uh, and lots of prayers there. And I'm just very hopeful that things are taking a good turn. So uh, thank you. And yes, we want to know about Will. After. Four days of, uh, in the hospital after open heart surgery on Tuesday, Will was discharged from yesterday. Wow. It's amazing just uh, the care and the attention and how oh. at Stanford University Children's Hospital, but this little dude, he is, he is tougher than nails. And he's, <laughs> so they're, they're staying at the Ronald McDonald House until they get the final clearance from the cardiologist. health and life. Thanks be to God. Yes. Well, I wanted to mention the, the little stuffed animals in the cart are looking very lonely out there. <laughs> if you think of it, and I know, like me, you probably do, and then forget. You might pick up a stuffed animal or two to add to the cart 
uh, for Anna's gift that will go to the children that are in the hospital and kind of a good tie-in with, with Will here. So for the children who might need that comfort, let's, you and me, try to remember to bring us stuffed animal to, for the go-kart. Yes, May Ron. I'm sorry. You were... Pardon me? Yeah, would you like to come here to speak? Thank you. I just want to say the first thing I would like to know that Americans are very lucky, to be honest with you. This is a great country and we have to take care of it. Uh, I'm not a Facebook fan, but I received something that Al Liker posted it. I want to read it to you guys. I don't know if you have seen it or not. So today, that's from a guy come called Rick Wooden. I don't know who that person is. But that's great because it happened to different people in this country. And this guy posted it. So today I stopped and filled up my car and I was thankful. Thankful that I have a car. Thankful I have money to buy gas. Thankful that there are no warplanes flying over me. Thankful that I will be eating soon. <laughs> then he continues. Thankful that all of my loved ones are safe and sound. Thankful that I live in a country where I have the freedom to do so many things. I didn't have to do the war in Iran and Iraq. That didn't happen. It happened to me. Yes. But, but it wasn't. It, you, you don't know what I have seen and I know what the people in Ukraine are facing. Thankful that I will sleep in silence and wake up to a beautiful day. I think it's time that we all be a lot more thankful and definitely more grateful. Thank you to God. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I had to share that with you guys. Thank you. I thank you. Our gratitude mounts to the heavens as we pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and around the world who are suffering today from war, from want, from fear. Thanks be to God. And let us rise in body or spirit to worship our Lord. <coughs> Thanks be to God for uh, all of you out there. And I don't know, I just can't go on without saying it, but we have we have an absolutely true blessing in this lady right here. Thank you. So please join in the call to worship. Let us worship God who has done great things. We will worship God who made a way of his world. Let us worship God who has caused, has caused streams of mercy to flow in the wasteland. We are the people of God that has formed through Christ. We worship him and we rejoice. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. We praise God for grace and has saved us. Hallelujah. We do rejoice. Let us pray. God of all creation, as a hen gathers her chicks together, so we gather here to worship within the safety and warmth of your wings. We look to you to know what righteousness is. 
We listen to you that we might know which path to take. Open our eyes and our ears so that we may follow you well. May we see your promises more brightly than we do the stars and hear your good news more clearly than the noise that inhabits our lives. We are here, God, watching and listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, please join in singing uh, hymn number 476. O oh, worship the King, all glorious above.
In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. I mean, it's sure it's a pardon. God, our light and our salvation, does not forsake us or leave us with our sin. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and offered the gift of healing repentance. Thanks be to God. everybody has their boxes and their books. If you don't, your box is probably hanging around with somebody that was planning to deliver it and didn't make it there. So if you are somebody who still has boxes to deliver and you don't have time for that, we are just starting spring break. So I have got an extra helper. We might be able to, to get those delivered for you. So hopefully if you do have it, you've spent some time looking through the book and Maybe you found some things that we didn't include in the box that, that you've enjoyed doing. If you do try some things that aren't in the box, let us know. We'd love to hear those things that you have found that work for you. The one I wanted to focus on this time, um, I wrote on my first one and my two are bigger than what you had in the box. But you had a bag of pretzels and these two postcards. Again, mine are not postcard size. But one had the legend of the pretzel and I'm not gonna read it to you because I know that you do have it. And the other had a pretzel prayer. I'm not gonna pray that with you because I know that you can do that yourself. Did want to mention that the focus on that is actually bread. And there are many references in the Bible to bread. I would encourage you to Google for more information on the times that bread is mentioned in the Bible and how. Many people may have memories of fresh bread baking, probably especially Wayne. I know for a fact that there's bread that bakes in his house because it comes here for communion. I remember going into my grandmother's house, my, my dad's mother. Um, there was frequently um, delicious rolls and bread there. And, and perhaps even, you know, as I mentioned that, you may be able to even smell it and kind of remember that. The pretzels that are in the box are symbolic, um, as shown on the, the two cards. I would encourage you to make fresh pretzels. If you don't have a good recipe from that, um, maybe you can find one on the internet. If you want me to help you find one, I would be happy to do that. Or you could even buy frozen ones at the store and still have the same experience. The prayer that's included talks about thinking of it at, at bedtime, I don't know if that's when you might want to eat a pretzel and think about the pretzel, but that is what she says in there. And if there's small children, your own children or grandchildren or neighbor's children, you might want to share that prayer with them too and think about the pretzels and that twisting and wrapping love that we get from God. So that is your love practice for, for this week. And again, if you do try some others, let us know what you have found. Thanks. Let us pray. Loving God, fountain of every blessing, open us to your life-giving word and fill us with your Holy Spirit so that living water may flow through our hearts, a spring of hope for a thirsty world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Please join in the responsive reading of Psalm 21 and listen for the many moods expressed by the psalmist. Note that he turns to the Lord regardless of what he is feeling or experiencing. And I'll read the odd verses you guys need. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against us, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will feel confident. One thing I ask the Lord, that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter, in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer him in his tent of sacrifice. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face, your face, Lord, do I seek Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off, do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and my mother Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have written against me, and they are breathing out my eyes. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take care. Wait to the Lord. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. We are in the Lenten season. We are on the road to Jerusalem. And our scripture reading from the Gospel this morning is from the Gospel of Luke as Jesus is traveling that road. Please listen for the word of the Lord as it speaks to your heart this morning from Luke chapter 13. <laughs> At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not meet, see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Rhetorical questions. And the answer rings clearly in the believer's heart. If our light, our salvation, and our stronghold is the Lord God, then surely we will fear no one. Right answer. In theory. But how does that work out in your life and mine? Or for that matter, in the psalmists? In Psalm 27, we hear the bravado of a young and confident King David. Perhaps he's just routed the Philistines and the Moabites and King Hadadezer. He's at the top of his game. And in his gratitude and exuberance, he thrills to his own invincibility. When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, they will stumble and fall. Dear David, beloved David, he's entirely too human. And yet we are told that David is a man after God's own heart. What a good name for a son. <laughs> David is passionate in his love for God. He also is repentant and real. David embodies in his life and in his song an authentic relationship with God, a real relationship. When he talks with the Lord, he is really communicating with someone. He's not simply saying his prayers. He knows and is known by God. Theirs is an intimate relationship founded upon trust, built on experience, and tested by fire. David is victorious over his enemies, yet he knows that he is dependent on God for protection, for victory, for his very life. He quits crowing rather quickly in this psalm. He asks of the Lord, seeks after the Lord. He wants to dwell in the house of the Lord and bask in God's beauty. God's beauty. He turns to the Lord in gratitude and supplication, but he's not a passive recipient of God's grace. He calls out with zeal. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in this tent, his tent, Sacrifices with shouts of joy, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. At the apex of this psalm, David celebrates a love relationship with God in full body praise and thanksgiving. I, you can just see him as he's a young king dancing in front of the ark as it comes into Jerusalem. And in these first six beautiful verses of Psalm 27, we hear from the psalmist in his strength, celebrating his identity as God's favored one, confident in victory, courageous in the Lord. In his book, Praying the Psalms, Walter Brueggemann outlines a simple schematic for understanding the psalms. I've found it very useful. He relates them to the conditions and movements of, of our lives. He writes, our life of faith consists in moving with God in terms of A, being securely oriented in life, B, being painfully disoriented, and C, being surprisingly reoriented. The Psalms are written out of these human conditions we know so well and reflect our states of relative equilibrium, dislocation, disequilibrium, and then relocation into a new equilibrium. The first six verses of Psalm 27 reflect the state of someone securely oriented in relationship to God. Many of our favorite psalms reflect this safe and confident stance that we sometimes enjoy in life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. 
for his steadfast love endures forever. These lines and many other songs reflect those safe harbors in our lives. They're havens to us and rightly to be treasured. Yet where do we go when we feel flung out of God's favor, under attack, or lost in the wilderness? Well, rest assured, as you know, many of the Psalms reflect just such moments, times of loss and disorientation and fear, times when we may feel that God has turned against us. Just listen. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in, the re in regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with waves. You might think of Jonah there. Haven't we all felt at times lost and abandoned by God? Maybe you do right now. Well, you're not alone. You can find companionship in the Psalms. How long, O oh Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their ravages, my life from the lions. With the psalmist, we're invited to bring all of our states and conditions from the loveliest to the lowliest to the Lord our God, trusting in the reciprocity of a real relationship with a real person. This relationship holds through the inevitable shifting moods and affections that are part of any close, ongoing bond. As any married person can tell you, there will be ups and downs, sometimes sudden ones. If we listen carefully to Psalm 27, we hear, maybe you heard it, an abrupt change of tone after verse 6. A song of praise suddenly turns into a psalm of disorientation. Something has shaken the equilibrium. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be merciful to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. We're not given to know exactly what has occurred to cause the psalmist to sense a disruption in his relationship with God, shaken perhaps by false accusations or family betrayals, he now implores the Lord for reassurance. Gone is any hint of bravado. Now we hear a pleading, almost demanding tone. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me. Psalms of disequilibrium and disorientation are called laments. And here in the middle of Psalm 27, David is surely lamenting. The language is raw and urgent. We would not expect religious or pious language from the psalmist or in our own prayers when the situation is desperate, and so are we. We just call out. Brueggemann tells us that most of the lament psalms are the voice of those who are mad as hell and are not going to take it anymore. <laughs> or maybe as sad as hell. <laughs> they are religious only in the sense that they are willing to speak this chaos into the very face of the Holy One. In a time of questioning and doubt, David does not turn away from the Lord, but still seeks to speak with God face to face. God responds to those yearnings to hear God's startling voice and risk a vital and tenacious relationship. We've traced the move from equilibrium to disequilibrium in Psalm 27, from praise to lament, but do we hear of a third movement into a new place, a reorientation, a faithful stance unlike the original status quo? I think so. If we listen carefully to those final verses, 
consider that possibility. I believe I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I think I read that the Bible says to wait something like 126 times and basically never says hurry up. <laughs> something to keep in mind. Perhaps it's not too great a stretch to imagine that we are hearing the voice of a more mature and self-aware man at this point. I think so. The earlier bravado is entirely absent, and in its place we hear a deep appreciation of God's initiative as well as God's goodness. The young warrior may have charged ahead with so much confidence that God had to frequently shelter him on a day of trouble. Having passed through chaos and disequilibrium while still claiming his intimacy with God, an older David is strong enough to wait on the Lord's leading. He's become wise enough to let the Lord fill his heart while he waits. And then in Luke's Gospel, the man on the road to Jerusalem is so intimate with God that fear never, fear never defines his choices. At one with his heavenly father, he moves with a courage born of trust. Yet Jesus obviously incites fear in others. Just before the events in today's reading in the final verses of Luke chapter 12, Jesus speaks words of radical disorientation to the Jewish establishment. He says, then people will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some of the last will be first and some of the first will be last. Fear arises at the prospect of losing something of value. Who stands to lose the most in the kingdom proclaimed by this itinerant rabble rouser, Jesus? Among others, the Pharisees and Herod, the religious and political powers of the day. Does Jesus fear that fox? Apparently not at all. He states he has business to complete, kingdom business, casting out demons and healing folks. He is privy to its impending fulfillment in Jerusalem. He knows he will not die in Herod's Galilee. God has his life and his death firmly in hand. We sense no disequilibrium in Jesus here. Yet in his mouth, we hear heart-rending words, a lament for the Jewish people. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left you. Foxes and chickens, surely a lamentable situation. Only Jesus' sheltering wings stand between them. And you were not willing, he says. Consider again that a lament issues from disorientation and displacement. God's chosen people have chosen to reject God's chosen one. Sent to save and shelter them, to lead them back to right relationship with God, Jesus is feared by the powerful and finally rejected by the people. They dread the demise of the status quo, which would mean loss of privilege and power. 
They fear the restructuring of their own personal and political kingdoms more than they fear the Lord. Jesus' lament is for them, even as he walks in courage toward his death, and it is breaking his heart. His words, see, your house is left to you. His words are chilling. The people believe themselves to be God's beloved house, the house of David, yet they've turned against God's son. Before we assume this warning is only for the Jews of Jesus' day, let us hasten to consider that we ourselves and our churches are included in Christ's plaintive lament. Are we ready to hear and heed the word of our Lord? Do we seek out and embrace the topsy-turvy kingdom of God that Jesus proclaims? Before we despair, listen. Jesus leaves open a vision and an invitation to reorientation, to a new future when God's people are able to say with a whole heart, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Right relationship may yet be restored. There is still time to scurry like chicks in a storm under the shadow of his wings. The choice was theirs and the choice is ours as we wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord as we walk with him in fear and courage toward Jerusalem. Amen. And I see I forgot our Lenten song of reflection. I think uh, we'll sing that first and then we'll go into the other one. So for just a moment, let us sing uh, in our Sing the Faith booklet number 2030. You may stay seated for this one and let it sink in and be a, a, a long amen to the sermon. Let it be to Lord. 
so nice to hear Tom Adcock's voice. <laughs> Such a beautiful bass. Let us join in our profession of faith at the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus, Jesus Christ, his only, only Son, our Lord, who was, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Let us enter into prayer today with all of the concerns and joys of our hearts uh, brought before the Lord in praise and lamentation and thanksgiving. However we come, let us come before the Lord. Jesus, remember us, remember me, when you come into your kingdom. Here are our intercessions. For your church, your churches around the world, we ask for your life, new life, renewed and holy life. For all who carry out ministries in your church, the priesthood of all believers, those who do all things in your name, we ask for grace and wisdom. For people who have accepted spiritual disciplines as part of their Lenten practice, we ask for you to inspire their discipleship. For Christians of every land, we ask for unity in your name as we raise our prayers for peace, Lord, peace in your name. For those we cannot, who cannot believe, we ask and we trust in your faithful love. For leaders and rulers in every land, we ask your guidance and for all people who suffer and sorrow today, we ask your healing peace. Holy God, your word, Jesus Christ, spoke peace to a sinful world and brought humanity the gift of reconciliation by the suffering and death he endured. Teach us who bear his name to follow his example. May our faith, hope, and charity turn hatred into love, conflict into peace and death, into eternal life, through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The gift of God's goodness and glory inspire us to give in return. Whether we offer today our money or our time, whether we give of our talents or our treasure or our very hearts, let us offer our gifts with joy and thanksgiving, praising God from whom all blessings flow as we rise to sing the doxology.
one, you have done great things for us, and holy is your name. Bless all that we offer you. As Mehran reminded us, it is so much we receive and so much we offer ourselves, our time, and our possessions, that through us, your grace and favor may be known to all the world for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Let us close with a rousing rendition of God of grace and God of glory. All five verses. Sorry, folks. <laughs> this hate skipping verse. heart. Take courage. It doesn't have to be there. God's given it to you. Take it. Wait for the Lord. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. And thank you, Dana, so much for playing for us today. We'll see you at fellowship hour.
Thank you, Dana.